Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this episode of What Matters. I'm so glad that you're here with me this evening. And today I have on another, all my guests are special, so I have on another special guest. She's an author. Her name is Carol Lee Parks. And today, Ms. Parks is going to share with us her journey with severe depressive syndrome. Now, I hope I got that right, and she'll correct me when she comes on if I'm wrong. Now, mental health has been much more discussed and much more public recently, and I'm very happy to hear that because we need it. Um, mental health issues have been very taboo. People have been shamed for it. People have not been able to find resources and support. And most importantly, I think, is that people aren't finding the support amongst those closest to them. I think one of the reasons why is that people are often afraid of things that they don't understand. And when people look at family members and friends that they perceive to be strong, they cannot or will not accept that the person is having a hard time. Now, depression, which is one of the vast things that can affect your mental health, um, it, there's many different forms. And today, I'm gonna ask, it's right, it's severe depressive syndrome, correct? Disorder, severe depressive disorder. And there are different types of uh, depression from situational to chemical and many in between. I'm not an expert, so I don't know them all, but there's all sorts of reasons and causes that it happens. So today we're gonna explore Carolee's journey from diagnosis to coping to healing. And her healing story is very, very interesting. And I found it fascinating when I was speaking to her. And we're also gonna share resources that you can reach out to in places you can go. And she'll also tell you what helped her cope and deal during this this journey. And it's not something that is necessarily over, but it's something that you can learn to deal with, you can learn to recognize, and you can get help for. So after the break, I'll be introducing you to Miss Carolee Parks. Think you have what it takes to bring value to the community? The TCN TV network is expanding and now accepting TV show proposals. Here's an opportunity to build celebrity status and become part of an elite group of community advocates that are focused on building, strengthening, and empowering our community in a positive way. Are you interested in embarking on a new adventure? TCN TV is searching for people interested in opportunities to change the conversation and pave an unforgettable legacy. If you feel you have something of value to offer, send a written show proposal to shows at mytcntv.com. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. so much for having me well this was a blessing for me as well oh my mic I'm sorry guys I'm still getting it you guys you know be patient with me I'm still getting it and I was just so excited to talk to Carolee so um, we were connected through another wonderful amazing woman and I know you're out there watching if not live on the replay Vimbai she had recommended that I speak to you now I will post the link that Vimbai had wrote it's a magazine called the weight she carries and that's how I discovered um, Carol Lee, I can call you Carol Lee. Yeah. So um, she has an amazing story, which she's going to share with us in parts. And you said now, during the intro, you corrected me, and you said it's called major depressive syndrome. Correct? Disorder. Disorder. See, I keep making things up. <laughs> major depressive disorder. And yes. so we're going to start at the beginning. Let's start at the very, very beginning and introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? 
So my name is Carolee Parks. Um, I am a co-author in a book called The Struggle is Real, Confessions of a Single Mother Too. Mm -hmm. And I've been working with children um, who have behavioral issues in daycare centers for over 20 years. Okay, that sounds like a, that sounds like a high stress job. It can be, but it's also very rewarding when you're able to support that family, support the child, um, and watch them make successes in terms of um, being able to manage the behavior a little bit better in the environments. So. Okay, so your job, I mean, even though it can be stressful, you love your job. I do. Okay, so that definitely, when you love what you do, even if it's stressful, it makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. So you've been doing that, you said, for over 20 years? Yes, I've been doing that for over 20 years. I'm in the process now of deciding to, if I'm gonna continue or if I'm gonna do a career change. So um, I'm considering social work, okay. um, motivational speaking. So and right now I'm in the season, I call it my transitional season of figuring out what's next. What's next. So it sounds to me that your default is to help. Yes. That would because be accurate. <laughs> that, that's, that's what you do. That's what you do for a living. And even considering a career shift and a career change, you're still in, in the, the field of helping people. Yes, and that has been the motivation um, with, it's ironic, it's been my struggle, but it's also been what's birthed my new voice. And so with that new voice, I want the educational part to support my personal experience mm -hmm. to see where it can go. So that's the motivation behind the thought of the career change. Okay, and so the, let's, let's go to the diagnosis. So when I was speaking to you before, you had said that this is something that you struggled with even before your official diagnosis, correct? That's correct. So as um, a teenager, as a young adult, um, I had gone through some traumatic events um, that I didn't deal with necessarily in the best way um, and didn't know how to deal with it and didn't really always know who to talk to about it mm -hmm. um, in terms of being honest in how deep things were affecting me. So you kind of just, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay, but not really talking about the depths of it. So. Um, as I got older, I couldn't hide it anymore, and mm -hmm. I had to seek help. And um, it came to a point where it was affecting my job, it was affecting my daily living, and so I had to explore options and use my voice to get myself help. Now, as much as you can share and as much as you're comfortable in sharing, when you said it would show up in your daily life, um, can you give us an example or at work, like what, so, what was happening? For instance, my absenteeism at work mm -hmm. became, um, had increased. My tardiness had, had increased. So instead of being like five, 10 minutes late, I became an hour late, I became two hours late. I was trying to find ways to start later at work mm -hmm. um, and finish later so that I didn't have to interact with as many people. Um, and the days off, went from one day a week to a couple weeks. I had to take like longer stretches of time off. Um, and it was because of the role I'm in, it was impacting my colleagues and it was impacting my job performance. And so there came a point where I had to further investigate what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it took maybe two big um, leaves of absence to actually get to a place of getting the right help that I needed. Okay, and something we had spoken about when we, when we spoke on the phone was that when you suffer from depression, when you are depressed, even the most basic activities take tremendous willpower. So even something that is habitual like self-care, hygiene, it becomes a chore, it becomes something very hard. And so to do something like get up and go to work and deal with other people because you're also dealing with people that have their own problems and that's what your job is is to help them and inside you feel like you're falling apart, apart. Yes. yes so I can definitely see why your absenteeism would increase and so forth and in your personal relationships what was happening um, well so just to touch about what you were saying with the, the personal hygiene and things like that that was part of the reason why the tardiness like I became later and later and later was because just that, trying to get up and get ready, I became exhausted because I was mentally fighting with myself saying, you need to go take that shower. You need to get into the car. Like everything became a pep talk. So by the time I was finished, I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. I needed a mini nap. Sometimes halfway to work, I would have to stop, wow. take a nap. 
and then continue my journey on the rest of the way because it was just so hard mentally to try to get through the day. So that, that happened. And then in terms of personal relationships, well, I wasn't really disclosing what was going on. Mm-hmm. So um, it, I think for some people it became frustrating for them because I wasn't returning calls. I wasn't going out with them. Um, I just kind of decreased back into my little rabbit hole mm-hmm. um, and just wasn't saying much. So, you know, it was hard for them to kind of figure out. And it did cost some, some friendships along the way just because um, I wasn't able, some of the times I didn't know what was going on myself. Mm-hmm. And so I couldn't tell them what I didn't know. Right, exactly. And so therefore, it became strain. It became a strain. Um, yeah, and, and for myself, personally, depression also showed up physically. So it I became physically ill as well. So there was often um, emergency visits as well. So it became twofold because then I have to take care of my physical health and my emotional health. And then because you have your physical health falling apart, that also impacts your emotional well-being. So, so it's a cycle. <laughs> so it became a cycle. It became a catch-22. Now, if anything that she's said so far resonates with you deeply, if you have a friend that s- suddenly or gradually has become very MIA, they're not acting like themselves, they're not returning phone calls, they're not going out anymore as they did, this is the time to check in. Because oftentimes when people are depressed, they do not reach out, they do not tell anyone, and sometimes they don't even realize that they're depressed. They may think that, people use the phrase, I feel down, or they think that tomorrow they'll feel better, and they don't reach out and speak about it. So if anything Carolee has said so far resonates with you, and you yourself feel that way, or you now putting it together suspect that someone that you know and care for might be feeling this way, reaching out makes a tremendous difference. Absolutely. I have to say that I've had some very good friends who call me every day, whether I answer or not, there are people who will send me a text message and those make the world of difference yeah. because those messages help me and motivate me to reach back out because it's like, you know what, if you are going to still reach out to me, it gives me like, you know what, I need to, like, it gives me that extra push to try. Um, yeah. And the fact that you're still accepting me in whatever state I'm in. Yes, acceptance. Um, makes a huge difference. It helps tremendously. It helps tremendously. (laughs) When we're back from the break, we're going to talk about how Carolee got diagnosed and what were the next steps after that, how she went through it, and how she began to cope. We'll be right back after this commercial break. have what it takes to bring value to the community? The TCN TV network is expanding and now accepting TV show proposals. Here's an opportunity to build celebrity status and become part of an elite group of community advocates that are focused on building, strengthening, and empowering our community in a positive way. Are you interested in embarking on a new adventure? TCN TV is searching for people interested in opportunities to change the conversation and pave an unforgettable legacy. If you feel you have something of value to offer, send a written show proposal to shows at mytcntv.com.
Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties team, powered by Remax West. Welcome back, and I'm here today with Carolee Parks, and we are discussing depression. And in Carolee's case, it is called, you say it because I keep messing it up, um, major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder. Now, before you go into how you were diagnosed and so forth, um, can you tell me what is the, the definition or what, what does, how is major de depressive disorder different from depression? So the major difference mm -hmm. is the severity of what you're going through. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be diagnosed by a psychiatrist. Okay. And they have their, um, their, their questions and their tests that they do. Mm -hmm. And um, based on where you measure on those testing will basically let you know what level of um, depression you're at. But that usually has to do with the length of time that you've been suffering mm -hmm. and the... Um, the depth of the symptoms that you're experiencing. Okay. So for myself, um, I had been battling with depression, as I said, as a teenager, but never got my first diagnosis until I was in my 20s. Um, and uh, I didn't want to take any medication for it for many reasons. Um, part of it was because I was in church and I just felt like I needed to rely solely on my faith. Right. Um, okay. Also, being Caribbean descent, that meant I was weak in my mind. So. I would cry when they told me I had to take it. I, I literally just cried for weeks on end because here I am struggling, but here I am needing some help. And it took a while. Wow. Um, it hit When I hit rock bottom was when suicidal thoughts were um, too much and too often. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that I needed to get help in order to stay alive. And um, now that I'm older, I realized that getting help is a sign of strength and not necessarily of weakness. Yes. Um, and that it is possible to still have my faith and still deal with um, medical intervention at the same time because you would for anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very thankful for the support that I have gotten from my pastor um, and other spiritual people around me. Um, and so that has helped tremendously. And um, just to get back to the actual diagnosis, that came about um, after I had uh, my second miscarriage, um, and my marriage was coming to an end. Okay. Um, and the depression was actually getting worse, and so they thought I would get back to work in about three months. So they actually initially gave me three months off and kind of just thought, you know, that's kind of like that's a reasonable time frame for two miscarriages in a year and that you should be able to get back to work. That's, that's um, amazing that they would think three months is just enough time to get over it, right? Yes, like just yes. Three, you, you've lost two children, your marriage is falling apart, in about 12 weeks you're going to be okay, back to work you go. Yes, wow. and what happened was when I went back in, I was just, I was really falling apart at that moment and the psychiatrist at that moment wanted to hospitalize me and I told her no okay. um, I'm not gonna do that and she was like I'm I'm really concerned about you um, because of the symptoms at that time were at such um, at, at, at such a severe level of display that she was worried to send me home um, so I made a commitment with her to follow. We came up with a plan mm -hmm. of action on appointments that I needed to follow. And if I didn't follow those appointments, then she would have no choice but to hospitalize, hospitalize me. And I did my best to make sure that I followed through with the plan mm -hmm. because I still had, I, I'm a single mom now. I have my daughter to raise. I'm like, I can't go in. Where is she going to go? Okay. So that was part of the reason and the decision that I chose personally that that wasn't the right choice for me um, right. and in, in that moment. So when you had the two miscarriages, did you already have your daughter and then you had two miscarriages? Yes. Okay, so you had a little, so you had a small child. 
Yeah, so she was two and a half. So she was just two when I had the first miscarriage and two and a half when I had the second miscarriage. Okay, now to me, I am no expert. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a psychotherapist. But given the fact that you had the, the um, history of it since your teens and then having all of these situational factors, um, miscarriages, you have a small child at home, that in and of itself, in the best conditions can be very, very stressful. And then your marriage as well, I mean, that's your life partner, that would be your, your major support system. And for all of that to be happening at that time, I can definitely see why it, it would not work out you going back to work. I, and then the job that you did, it's not like you sat in a chair quietly and looked at spreadsheets. You were dealing with people and their emotions and their, their problems and their difficulties while you were going through this. And like you said, seeking help doesn't make you weak. It makes you strong. And just hearing this and the fact you kept going, to me, I think she's tremendous. I think that the strength that that shows, the, the desire to even keep going, Carolee, like, that's amazing to me and we're, we're at there's another amazing part that we will get to later but um i think all these things they really speak to the strength of your character and the strength of the base person you are and even when you put other things on top of it who you are fundamentally i think that was also a huge saving point for you that you know you you are you are you are you are a helpful person, you're a positive person, and you kept trying. I do give God thanks that there was something inside that wanted to live. And I credit that, that I'm thankful that I, I, I entered church at a young age. And one of the things that CAMH actually includes is that you should have spirituality in your life. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was a real eye-opening moment, that I can do both. Absolutely. And so I can have my faith and deal with this and have good days and have bad days and overcome. And so I need to have my support system. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my support. It's, this is not something that you can get over by yourself. No. I cannot encourage. The natural desire is to withdraw and go into a hole because you just feel so misunderstood. The negative thoughts in your mind are so severe that you... And there's certain things that you're scared to share with people because you don't want that to um, Color come their back. View. Yes, yeah. and to be judged by what you're going through or to be defined by that moment in your life. But understanding that just because I deal with that, that is not who I am. Who I am is bigger than, than that. that. And that's that. she said it way better than I did. And that's exactly what I was saying. Who you are is so much bigger than this illness and another comparison that you made earlier which i i ask people to think of this as you downplay bipolarism and depression and schizophrenia and all of these things is that if you had a heart condition if there was something wrong with your heart you would go see a cardiologist and you would get your medication and you would take it if there was something wrong with your liver or your bones or your eyes, you would see the, the correct specialist and you would get the treatment that you need. Your brain is another organ in your body and it's the one of the most powerful ones and it's not even that well understood. And sometimes the depression's chemical, sometimes it's situational, um, sometimes it's hereditary, we had discussed that, that's mm -hmm. something that runs in families, but it's real, it's very, very real. And in not being ashamed and getting help and speaking your truth, that's where you start to find relief. And and that non-judgmentalness of your support system, right? Not saying, well, you know, the last time I spoke to her, she said she's feeling suicidal, so she's just that woman who just wants to kill herself. Understanding that that's how she felt in the moment and having the support to get past that moment she's still Carol Lee on the other end, just like you're still you or that person that is in your mind watching this show that you're thinking, I need to reach out. They're still them. It's just like if they broke a bone and was in a cast or got a rash or any of those things, it's not who they are. It's a condition that they're going through. That's correct. Absolutely. I, I 
couldn't say that better myself. Wow, I see I got one in. <laughs> um, so you after so after the second miscarriage, you were officially diagnosed and you started getting treatment. So you said she had a plan and this included medication and therapy, correct? Yes, so um, there was a gap. So after I had the second miscarriage, um, I was still in my marriage. Um, and then there came a point where that dissolved and we moved. It was shortly after that, that um, I guess just everything, being a single mom, this is not what I planned, dealing with all of these things, um, it just, it got progressively worse. And so when I went in for a follow-up appointment, because part of being off is that you, you do like a monthly check-in. Mm -hmm. And when I went in, that was part of it. But during that time, they were sending me to group because part of you know being on long-term disability, you have to have a plan. And so I was going through um, different workshops, but they were not being effective because the negativity in my mind was so strong at that moment that it wasn't effective. So she pulled me actually from all groups and said, okay, we can't do that, you have to come in. And I had to, she would give me maybe two things that I had to commit to doing because if she gave me any more than that, that just wasn't gonna happen. And they were very basic things, very, very simple basic things. But understanding that when it's gotten that bad, something as simple as brushing your teeth is a chore. Is a chore. It's and a it chore. could take, it, it, sometimes it took up to an hour to mentally get myself to say, you gotta brush that teeth. You gotta get you up. You gotta get, get up. up. Take the sheet off of you. you. Stand up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Step by step. step. And like a, absolutely minute. step by step. And as somebody who's been depressed, but have never has never been diagnosed, but I've gone through it. I've had dark times. I think on a much smaller scale, I understand what you mean. So when we come back from this break, we will be speaking about what brought you out on the other side. Um, I find this part of the story especially fascinating. So we'll see you after the break. That was a very quick break. As you see, our producers come and fix the microphones that I always mess up. And so we are here with Miss Carolee Parks, and she is staring, sharing her story of her journey, her her struggle with, you say it? Major depressive disorder. I will get this right. I keep wanting to call it a syndrome. Yeah. Um, so when we spoke on the phone and i always tell my guests i don't want to interview you before the show too much because i do like discovering with the audience as well but there's something that she told me about this journey on the way out and you say that this is something that will stay with you all your life and it is a constant struggle but you're on a much better end of it now right yes so um how she got out and i've already commented and some of this i've only discovered now on how tremendous your spirit is um, I see exactly why Vimbais picked you to, to write an article about your spirit is tremendous and that, that base of wanting to help and caring for others and still, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and wanting desperately to live even though it didn't feel good at all, to me that just speaks so much about who you are. And then how Carolee came out on the other side again to me it just is in this theme so your psych psychologist or psychiatrist psychiatrist <laughs> right so your psychiatrist um so it was a combination of medication therapy sessions um group therapy sessions which you were taken out of for a while mm -hmm. because you you needed to strengthen your own inner voice enough to be able to participate right. with others even in that controlled situation so it can get very very dark um, yes. very dark and 
you, so at, once you started doing individual sessions, mm -hmm. then you were able to go back into group sessions, right? No, so I've actually never been put back into group because okay. my concentration um, was so bad. So that's also one of the, 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 the what would I call it, symptoms of depression is the inability to concentrate. And for me also was sleeping. I slept a lot. And no matter how much sleep I got, I still, still needed tired. more. Yeah, you're still um, tired. And so part of the way that I was able to still take care of my daughter was to sleep while she was at school mm -hmm. so that when she came home, I just knew if I could get through those three hours, she's going to get to bed. Right. So then I would just sleep through the night as well. And then there was these, odd, like I just had a really bad sleeping pattern, which is part of it as well. Um, but through that, um, one thing that she reiterated and what became my reality was, no matter what anybody says to me, it doesn't matter what my pastor says, it doesn't matter what the psychiatrist says, the fight has to come from within. Mm -hmm. And so you're the only one who can take that first step. They can tell you how to take that first step, but somewhere deep down inside, you have to find the first step. And so I identified that part of my current issue was, yes, I have these miscarriages, but I was also struggling with being a single mom and adjusting to that. Um, and I went online, and I found um, this author, Farah Hutchinson, mm -hmm. um, who's recently got married. So sorry, Farah, I got your last name wrong. But um, she had written a book. And it's called The Struggle is Real Confession of a Single Mom. Right. So I ordered it. I read it. And amazingly enough, even though the concentration was so bad, I finished that book relatively quickly because I was just in so much need to hear other stories. Right. And we ended up talking. And then she invited me to this group called Overcoming, um, o Sisters Overcoming Together. And I met some other amazing ladies. And while talking and sharing my story during that time, she said, I have another book coming out and I want you to share your story. And I was like, mm, I don't know about that. Just because of all the things that I was going through and the negativity and whatever else. Um, but she said, no, somebody needs to hear your story. It's different, um, but yet it's the same. Somebody needs to know your story. And so um, she believed in it more than I ever could. And her strength to push me through helped me to birth that story. And so I became a co-author in the second volume of that book which is called The Struggle is Real, Confessions of a Single Mom too. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So this is it. And funny enough, I have seen this book before. Before I ever met Carol Lee, before I knew anything about her, I had seen the, actually the first one, and now this is the second one. And in the comments as well, we will show you um, the link and tell you how you can buy the book. But this is The Struggle is Real, Confessions of a Single Mother 2, and it's compiled by Farah, who probably isn't Hodgson anymore. And there are two, four, six, seven authors on this yes. book. And what I found completely amazing in this telling of her story was that, again, in this dark, dark place with you know, just trying to get through each day, basic things like take care of your own child, um, you found it in you to share. Yes, and, and in the struggle to write this, and there was many times I told her I just can't, and she said, no, I need you to do that chapter. And there's something in the power of having people believe in you. And my girlfriend was like, no, you can do it. And somehow their, their belief in me gave me strength to push through. And so, you know, it wasn't without tears. It wasn't without sleepless nights. Um, but again, through faith, through prayer of those around me, um, through good friends who, who held me up when I couldn't hold my whole, own head up, um, it helped to birth this. And it has been a tremendous turnaround for me because in the midst of all of that, it has birthed my voice. And in birthing my voice, it's giving me strength because now I'm at a place where I'm looking to think about going back to work. And I've been out of work for four years, and they never thought I would be going back to work. That's amazing. That is amazing. So, and the strength that the people around you can give, the strength of a positive circle. And for anyone out there, I mean, I'm really, really big on friendships. I'm very, very big on who you surround yourself with, who your circle is. And sometimes, when we really stop and we look, we realize the people around us aren't good for us. And that can hurt a lot because they're family members and they're friends you've had for many, many years. 
But if you stop and you're honest with yourself and you don't go with nostalgia and loyalty, you realize these people are poison to your soul. And something that a lot of people don't believe because they haven't experienced it like I have, but you can find tremendous strength in strangers. Yes. You find a group of people that you have something in common with and they will cheer for you and they will champion for you more than that friend you've had for 26 years. Yes. Um, I have met random people online that are my biggest cheerleaders. Their belief in me, as you said, their belief in me is my fuel. When I run out of belief in myself, it is these people that I've known for a few weeks or a few months or a few re years relative to the people I've known for a long time. And their belief, their honest, genuine belief, they're not just gassing you up, but they believe in you. They see something in you you can't see yourself, right? Absolutely, and, absolutely. And looking at yourself through those lenses, that's what gives Makes you strength. Difference. So yes. I always say surround yourself by people whose voice you can use when your own does not work. Yes, because if you're in the midst of the depression, your thoughts are, are very negative. The way you perceive the world is negative. And so you need that strength, that your, your system around you, to help you to see it differently so that you can change those lens until you're able to do it more naturally. And so, and I echo what you say about the strangers because um, I lost a lot of friends and I lost a lot of things, but I've gained so much that by going to that meeting where I didn't know anybody and taking that chance and saying, I gotta try something different because what I'm doing right now is not, not working. working. So, not working. you know, it's scary, but as I tell my daughter, embrace the fair and just do it anyways. I'm like, yes, it's okay to feel what you're feeling, but do it anyways. And right. so that, that has helped me on this journey tremendously. That, that is amazing that, you know, you went to this and again, um, things that interest you, groups um, on social media that you see that you're curious about, tuck your fear in your pocket and go. Just go. Because it can change your whole trajectory of your life, right? Yes. Uh, completely. And you will find strength in people that you don't know that well. So now in the process of writing the book, I mean, you said it was a struggle. You, you So many times you were like, I can't do this. This isn't going to happen. And then... When was your, we may have to wait till after commercial break, so I'll pose the question and you can gather the answer in your head, but after you, you wrote the book and you, you, know, you handed in your part and it, it got all, put, what, was it the handing it in? Was it seeing your name on the cover? What was that aha moment for you when you knew you were coming out on the other side. Don't answer that. We're going to go off to commercial break. We will be back in a moment and we will hear Carolee's answer to that. And we're also going to give you some resources and some of her own tips on how to deal, how to cope, how to get through those really, really dark times. So we'll be back after this break. find laughter in many things sometimes uh, that's what we have to do so what was your aha moment when was it that you came and realized that this was it this was the thing that did it for you and it doesn't mean it's the end but it's definitely brought you to a different level on this journey right yeah believe it or not it took weeks for it to sink in that that was the moment of 
when things turned. Um, because I did it and I went through the motions, but it didn't sink in until after. And I think, this may sound really silly, but I think it was when I started to get feedback from the book. Because even though lots of people came out to support me, when they actually started to give me feedback about the chapter, mm -hmm. I was just surprised that people were reading it. <laughs> and I know that sounds really silly. They're like, what did you think we were going to do? I'm like, I just thought you guys were being I kind. You were being nice. You were going to buy the book and like, and you, yeah, I don't I was know, just going to get plant on right. it or something. And so when I started to really get the feedback from people of how they related to it, how it helped them, that was a moment that I was like, okay, this wasn't for nothing. No. That was the moment that was like, yeah, things are changing. Realize you're, where you're coming from and here you are when they didn't think you would be here. And in the chapter, I was just telling you shortly about it, I even talk about the point where I was rejected from a trial drug for depression because no medication was working. And, and I that's when that. I started laughing because I thought that was the most ridiculous <laughs> thing. How do you reject a depressed person in a drug? That, that's amazing to me. So Yeah, so the, I talk about that in here. And so just highlighting those things and really saying, and reading it back for myself and mm -hmm. just, yeah, that's you you're talking about. That's, that's you who overcame that by God's grace, you know? So I, I'm... I think it's now sinking in that it's changing. And, and um, I started a, a, a mother's group at a, at a different place. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I learned there was that I can be both things. Because I think I thought that because I had this good moment with the book and then I had a dark day, mm -hmm. I was really confused by that. But I realized, you know what, I can be all of those things. You're multidimensional. Yes. And so that has helped me tremendously to note that even though I may still get a dark day, that doesn't that doesn't override the things that I've overcome. And I think that was the biggest aha moment for me, that if you could do this, you will come out and you will be okay. And I, that's the aha moment after hearing people testify and write reviews for me mm -hmm. on it. That was like, oh, okay. okay. So it's real. <laughs> and you know, what she had said about, she, she needs you to tell your story. They, they need to hear your voice. And I think that's something that's really important. And that's the reason that I asked you on today is because I believe people need to hear your story. Um, there's so many people that feel that they're alone in what they're going through and they're the only ones and they're the only people doing that weird thing. And then <laughs> someone speaks and they're, they're speaking your own life. Mm -hmm. And you realize you're not alone or you realize there's someone who has, it, has been through even worse if you're quantifying than you and that's what gives you strength is knowing that your voice can help so many other people and which it has because I I am sure that there is I'm positive there is at least one person out there that is going to either look for help themselves or reach out to somebody that now they're putting it all together is probably going through a similar thing so um, some of the things I'd like you to share is, one, I'd like to know if you had any strategies or if there was anything that you would um, do. And you told us about one, which was kind of scheduling your very, very long naps around your daughter so that you could be there for her and give her, you know, your presence. Um, were there, are there any other suggestions that you can make to people or tips or Things that worked for you. I mean, the same thing doesn't work for everyone, but just wondering if there's anything yeah. you can share. The thing that um, really stands out right now is, I think, is interrupt your thoughts. So if you're going through a cycle of negative thoughts, find a way to interrupt it. And what I mean is you could find journaling if you have the ability to concentrate. If you cannot concentrate, have your favorite song on YouTube or anything because what you're trying to do is break that thought. That thought will just keep going and circling and circling and take you further and further and further down the road. But if you can interrupt it, you have a hope of just kind of shifting, mm -hmm. right? If you have the ability to get outside for a walk, even if it's for two minutes, the fact that you're shifting your position makes a difference. Okay. Um, anything that you can do, change it to your favorite show, a YouTube track, call a friend, Anything that can get you to interrupt that negative thought right there in that moment, 
then that would be the number one thing that I would suggest for anyone to do. Um, the other thing that I, I do use is I realize that I need to have a plan of action for my dark days before the dark day comes. Mm -hmm. So on the day that I feel a little bit better than the other days, I need to know who can I call. So I, my support system personally, I have a prayer line that I can call. I have my pastor that I can call. I have the, the doctor that I can call. And if I can't get the psychiatrist, I have my family doctor okay. and I have my good friends. So to have those numbers that are easily accessible, mm -hmm. um, because when you're in that dark place, you don't have time to look and think where they are. So save it in your phone, save it in, like, you know, how you have notes on your phone. Right. Just have a plan close by of um, what you can do. And oftentimes, you, they'll say to you, do what you like to do. Okay. Well, in that moment when you're really dark, there's not much that you, you like, like to, to do. do. Right. But if there's anything that you can do, do it in that moment. Even if you don't feel anything just do it anyways even if it's just going through the motions there were times i took myself to the movies because the shift of environment makes a difference mm -hmm. so those those are some of the tips that i had um that i used and i also um went to different groups and met new people um and that's really hard in that moment but yeah um, you would be surprised how strangers will accept you no matter where you are when they know nothing about you. Um, people can be very gracious. Yeah. Um, and so they don't know what you used to be like. They don't know if you used to wear makeup and you used to dress in all these fancy clothes and now you're in track pants and a t-shirt. They're just meeting you that way so they'll just accept they you, take you as, as you are. So they don't know anything else and that helped because there were days my criteria was it was clean. That was it. Mm -hmm. So trying to, you know, get into some fancy outfit to go to wherever, that's that's not happening. But if you could just get something on and go somewhere where there's other people, you would be surprised the difference How that those that helps. can make. Yeah. yeah, because when you're depressed, actually the last thing you want is other people. Mm -hmm. And it's actually exactly what you, you need. need. Um, and having that friend that you can really speak to or you can call and go, it's it, not today, and they'll sit there with you in the silence or they'll talk about something trivial just to keep your company. Um, that's really important. And as you said, your faith as well. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that even the, psychi the, the, the psychiatrist, psychiatrist um, recommends having some spirituality in your life. They're not telling you to pick up this or that religion, but some yes. kind of spirituality. And in terms of resources in the city, can you name some places that people can can go? Yeah, so Cam H um, actually has um, an emergency um, link on there. And so whatever region you're in, mm -hmm. they have different links of phone numbers that you can access. They actually have a 24 hour mobile service that can get to you if you can't get to the hospital. They let you know what hospitals wow. you can get to um, if you're feeling suicidal and you don't trust yourself to be alone. Um, if you can't help yourself, I cannot stress enough, um, get help, get yourself some help. And um, there is no shame in getting help. It is your strength. It you're trying strength. to stay alive and that's the focus. If you can stay alive one more day, then you have the opportunity to overcome it. Um, and that would be my that would be my message that there is absolutely no shame. And I encourage you, encourage that friend to get the help that they need. You can be saved in their life because you just don't know what is going on in somebody's mind. That, that, I, I, I agree 100%. And I can't thank you enough for coming on. You've been tremendous. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for opening up. Thank you for sharing something that so many people hide. And I really hope that this reaches someone who needs to hear it, who really needs to hear that they're not alone and there is help and there's a way out. And some of the very things you don't want to do are the very things that you need to do. My social media link and how to contact me will be there. I know that they've been shown throughout the show and they'll be in the link as well as Carol Lee's. Um, also too, The Struggle is Real, the Confessions of a S Single Mother. Um, that is also available. If you reach out to Carol Lee, she'll tell you how to get your copy. Again, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time and putting yourself out there when I know that you may not necessarily have wanted to. She's been tremendous. I thank you all for joining me for another episode of What Matters. I'm here 
to help enlighten and lift and empower and i know that you helped do that for the audience today too thanks a lot guys i'll see you again next tuesday